Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Good afternoon, I guess, as well. Good evening. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to have with us today Dr. Eddie Bruce Jones. I should introduce myself first. My name is Justin Steele. I'm an associate professor of law and urban planning uh, here at MIT, and I'm tremendously uh, excited and delighted to have with us today Dr. Eddie Bruce Jones, who is the deputy dean of the School of Law and head of the Department of Law at Birkbeck College at the University of London. Dr. Bruce Jones has been a visiting fellow at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History in Germany and a visiting professor of law at Boston University in the United States. Dr. Bruce Jones is also an associate academic fellow of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple. Dr. Bruce Jones is the author of Race in the Shadow of Law, State Violence in Contemporary Europe, and co-author of two forthcoming textbooks on equality law. He's also currently writing a monograph on indentured labor in Jamaica. His scholarship has also been widely published in journals in law and the humanities. He serves on the boards of directors of the Institute for Race Relations and the UK Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group and the advisory board of the Center for Intersectional Justice in Berlin. He's also a comparative law specialist for the Independent Commission on the Death of Uri Jalo on Police Brutality and Due Process. We are very excited to have Dr. Bruce Jones with us today to discuss race, refugees in Europe, a look back at the last decade. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for question and answer. You can put your questions uh, in the Q&A function in Zoom, and uh, I will ask them to Dr. Bruce Jones. Thank you again, Dr. Bruce Jones, for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Justin, and thank you, Laura, for organizing this. It's really great to be um, talking with colleagues from a range of different backgrounds and disciplines um, about a topic in migration. And, um, and it's really great to, to hear your questions afterwards. So please, um, please stick around for the Q&A afterwards. Um, I'll have to begin by saying I am, uh, I'm not a legal practitioner in um, immigration and asylum law. So there are certain procedural issues that I probably just won't have answers to. And my areas of, of interest and research are adjacent to, I think, um, <laughs> adjacent to a deeper expertise in, in asylum law and in, in certain aspects of policing. It touches upon all of these areas, but I don't think, I don't consider myself an expert in any one of these areas. But because I've been working adjacent to a variety of different topics that are important for understanding the relationship between race and racism and um, the treatment of refugees and refugee law in various places in Europe, uh, my standpoint might be uh, a bit of a bird's eye view on what's been happening in Europe at least over the last 10 years and um, both how things are changing in terms of public attitudes and, um, and policy regarding the intersection of race and refugees uh, and, and a bit of you know, on the ground case examples of, of things that have resonated with um, what I see as, as general trends. So I, I'm trying, I'm gonna try to keep this succinct. I'll probably talk for about 45 minutes, then open it up for, for questions. And it really is at that level of kind of seeing the, the, the panoramic view of what's happening in, in Europe. Uh, before I begin, I'm gonna show a video that was controversial, it is controversial, and it's um, maybe a little unfair, I'll, I'll have to say, for me to show it because it was withdrawn, but it was produced and it was put out there by the European Union uh, for the purpose of, um, of discussing and debating enlargement of the, of the EU. But it was basically a campaign video to, to get us to think about the values of the European Union um, and the potential enlargement of the European Union. It was produced in 2012 and swiftly with, withdrawn. But I'm showing it because it gives you a bit of the context that I think brings together migration and, and race within the European Union context. And we return to some of the themes in the video um, over the next decade. So while it was controversial as an advertisement, in terms of public policy, there are still some themes that resonate. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, hold on one moment before I, before I do that. Let me get this cued. So the video clip is about um, 
about a minute long. So I'm going to share it now. So this video really does set a certain tone about difference and about ongoing discussions in the European Union and in its member states about integration, particularly cultural integration, religious integration, um, and migration. And it also, you know, in a very overt way, characterizes um, what it means to be European and what it means to have the authority to kind of put forward European values and what it means to be non-European. The three you know, men of color in the, in the video who all entered, you know, barged into this scene in a very violent way can be seen also to represent um, the BRIC countries. So, uh, well, some of them at least. The, uh, so Brazil, India, and China, um, Russia not not notably missing. And, um, and they enter violently and then they're, they're kind of, somehow there's this psychic connection where they're taught to meditate and sit in a circle um, by the person, you know, white woman who represents the European Union. And then they sit in the circle and then she multiplies and then they disappear. So, I mean, there's so many levels to, to this imagery, um, but it's not, too far divorced from some social policy that, that we'll see a, a bit later. But it also, it really does encapsulate some of the discourse, the public discourse around um, things like cultural swamping, cultural capacity um, for, for, uh, for immigration in general and refugees become a part of that conversation um, and on the ability to ever integrate. Uh, so this is underlying um, the the kind of basic level of understanding of what European Union is capable of doing in terms of integration. And there is a clear racial a way in which this is discussed in terms of race. So while we saw it visually in the video, it's also discussed as a form of being able to identify difference or identify values. It's the, the kind of level of connecting overt types of racism with cultural racism. But we'll, we'll come back to that. But I just wanted to kind of set out how clearly this is um, ingrained into the public discourse in, in Europe um, and how that translates in, in terms of um, policy in some sense. So now I'm going to share a slideshow and, and I'll begin. So I'm going to be talking about things that have happened over the last decade and in different parts of the European Union. So there are ways in which what I'll mention are trends, but you know, they're, they're, it's more complicated than simply seeing a trajectory from kind of then until now. But those complications, I think some of them are local. So when I talk about the UK, there are local issues that have arisen in the UK that have prompted certain types of social debates, for example, around counter-terror that have driven some social policy in ways that haven't happened in other member states. Um, but race and, and refugees and refugee law and protection have been uh, really coordinated and interwoven in a lot of these member state um, 
uh, conversations about uh, about race. So I'll talk a bit about race in Europe generally, then refugee law in Europe generally, then this concept of crimes of solidarity that I'll introduce just to give an added dimension to the ways in which um, uh, intervention by the public or by NGOs into either political or social types of activism or the conversation about where to draw the line between securitization and humanitarian relief um, should be. Then I'll talk a little bit about profiling and policing and in particular the ways in which that sometimes ties in not only race and ethnicity because of profiling, but the context for profiling is sometimes an immigration related context. So then they become interwoven sets of issues, which is complicated sometimes by the fact that in some spaces, establishing that an issue is an issue of race as opposed to an issue of immigration is also important because you, you do frequently encounter in the European context that when, when you identify things that would possibly otherwise, or maybe by the person experiencing it, be seen as racial discrimination, um, it's, it's sort of written off or recast as an issue of migration status, which seems a more permissible form of, um, of legal recognition and treatment for, for many. And then I'll just touch upon some of the political, um, some aspects of political discourse that have shifted to the right. You know, I think that's been in the past 20 years in Europe, um, a, a trend that's been in some countries quite quick and in some countries a slow kind of trend toward the right and how that's affected public discourse around race and immigration. And then I'll just kind of leave with a question or two so that we can have discussion. So in terms of the spheres of discussing race and um, migration, and in particular, the migration of people who are applying for asylum, there's political and public discourse that's been shared. And we can, we can already assume that there, there might be a racial aspect to thinking about migration anyway. But in terms of the way that participation in public life is framed, whether that's public, um, public life in terms of politics or public life in terms of um, social forms of citizenship, those things are, um, are shared in terms of race and thinking about refugees. Sociocultural integration and the possibilities thereof, national belonging and a sense of full citizenship rather than the kind of um, conditional forms of social belonging that are ascribed to people who are in some cases to non-white citizens, but in other cases to non-citizens. Legal recognition and debates around both in terms of race, the use of the category of race and the recognition of racism through those categories and legal recognition in terms of the allowances to those who don't yet have citizenship, including refugees. Structural inequity, and that's about recognizing things that are outside of the purview of legal provisions that already exist. So the average person on the street might think that um, there are structural inequalities that exist in society and be able to describe them, but then a lawyer might say, well, those aren't the types of things we can litigate or resolve using the, the set of legal tools that we have. So the discussion on structural inequity has changed in Europe, and I think in a positive way. It, um, it's not that that's necessarily resulted in lots of results for those who are facing structural forms of discrimination, but um, there's a shared space in terms of structural forms of violence and lack of provision for people facing racial discrimination um, with the space that's held by um, those debates for people who are, um, who are vulnerable because of their status as uh, asylum applicants or refugees. And colonialism and contemporary debates around geopolitical history and present. So these discussions happen both at the, at the point of discussing race and at discussing migration politics and, um, and the kind of the moral desert around free movement. 
So really briefly, and I'm sure, you know, the legal scholars um, at this seminar will probably have lots of things to add and lots of things to, um, to, to debate. But in general, in the European Union, in terms of race, there are protections at the EU level. And um, those protections are in the main treaty of the European Union, um, Article 19 of the uh, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union is a non-discrimination article that includes racial discrimination. There's also the Race Equality Directive, which was passed in 2000, which defines discrimination um, and it mandate, mandates that national governments um, prevent discrimination, that they have agencies that are required to promote um, equality and to protect against racial discrimination and, uh, and to monitor um, the coherence of um, uh, the observance of, of national law of EU policies and laws. And so there have, there have been, you know, there have been legal cases on racial discrimination uh, at the European Union level and, um, but basically European Union directives need to be trans, um, uh, trans, transferred into the national law. They need to be basically, um, uh, what's the word, I'm missing the word. Um, uh, yeah, implemented in, in through national legislation in order to be um, in effect. And so member states have implemented the, the law that's outlined in the directive so that national laws now include provisions to protect against racial discrimination. I'll talk about some of the problems that come up with that in, in a few moments. And then recently, you know, in the last year and a half, um, and this in some ways is also owed to the heightened uh, awareness that people have around racial discrimination and structural forms of discrimination as a result, not only of George Floyd's death in the United States, but, um, but conversations that have been happening in Europe, you know, with activists and, um, and scholars and, and even politicians in Europe over, over the decades. And so in 2020, the European Parliament passed um, uh, a non-binding um, uh, resolution to appraise the international situation, which was the death of George Floyd, and to make proclamations about combating racism in the European Union. Uh, so it's just a position statement, really. Then there was an EU action plan to combat discrimination on the basis of race um, that set out objectives and recommendations that go from 2020 to 2025, including uh, putting forward ideas about what structural discrimination is. And that's also a, a kind of an advancement at the European Union level. Um, the need to address law enforcement's use of racial profiling. And that's something that member states, national laws typically give quite a lot of discretion to, to the use of um, of, of concepts of difference in identifying criminal, be, criminal behavior. So there, there's the latitude to racially profile, even if on the surface of anti-discrimination laws, it would seem to be inappropriate. Um, so the need to address that in member states was identified. The need to collect disaggregated data on race was identified, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment as well. And um, it en encourages member states to develop their own action plans to combat racism over the next few years. So it is a positive development. I think what, the, what some of the criticisms have been is that it doesn't actually methodically set out a plan for putting these things into place that is gonna be effective in member states. So it's, well and, it's all well and good to, to say these things and to acknowledge the existence of structural racism but it's not really going to help unless there's a clear, um, it, unless there's clear guidance that actually has some consequence if that guidance isn't followed. But tomorrow, uh, on the 19th of March, there is a summit against racism, an EU summit, where things like this are going to be discussed and debated. And I'm, I think it is, I think the public can view parts of it. So it's online. If you Google EU Summit Against Racism, you should be able to find links and information about the discussions that will happen tomorrow. Okay. 
There we go. But the question of data that I mentioned a moment ago is a really big one in most of the European Union. So there are problems with conceptualizing what race is. And I think that is also owing to the multiple levels of thinking about what race is as a social construct. So that problem exists anyway. But the vast majority of European Union countries don't actually even use a concept of race when gathering information on discrimination um, for their own monitoring purposes or for the purpose of monitoring their obligations under EU law. And some countries don't allow the collection of, of this data. So they don't not only do they not collect it themselves or they don't allow others to collect it. Um, instead, most EU countries operate policies of prohibition with exceptions with regard to disaggregated data, um, including using proxies like nationality of birth, nationality of the parents, the language spoken at home, geographical areas of residence within the country, socioeconomic status, education level, and in some cases, ethnicity, which is then defined in ways that are quite specific and, and mostly around nationality and country of origin, um, rather than around racial group in terms of being racialized as, for example, Black or, <clears throat> or, um, or Roma. So two countries that, that stand out in this regard, and it's, it's not that they're alone in this regard, although France is quite, I guess, at one end of that spectrum, are France and Germany. So in France, there's a prohibition on the designation of race, a categorical one um, that prohibits the collection of racial data. And the categorization is a criminal offense. So using the category of race as an employer, for example, um, is a breach of criminal law, which means that someone who's discriminated against in terms of race in an employment context then would need to raise a complaint with the Ministry of Labor that needs to investigate the employer on criminal grounds, which some scholars have argued actually, while it seems like a higher bar, a higher burden um, on the employer and a more serious type of crime, it actually prevents more cases from being brought because it's a big deal to go to the Ministry of Labor to have them investigate on criminal grounds an employer. The Ministry of Labor doesn't necessarily have the incentive to go to employers and perhaps ruin the relationship that they have with certain employers with such kind of a, um, a huge claim. And there's not a lot at um, it does, there's not a huge return on investment for people to bring these, these claims forward because it's not clear that people are going to then uh, recover um, financially from being discriminated against as much as they are gonna file a criminal you know, complaint. And additionally, the word race has been removed from the French constitutional equal protection guarantees because it's seen to be um, a falsehood. So it shouldn't be you know, used as a term of, um, of legal categorization. So it's been removed from the constitution. And so part of the underlying, um, the underlying, I guess, idea is one of French republicanism, that being French is more important than the differences that divide French people. And that one, and that this division is moreover a false one. So we shouldn't actually be emphasizing difference, especially if it's a false one. So it should be removed, including the terminology. So the issue there, of course, is that taking away the word um, doesn't remove the phenomenon of racism or racial discrimination, but it does make it more difficult to actually identify when discrimination is happening. And it also makes it difficult if they're not going to collect data to see patterns of racism in society. Uh, so these things frustrate the ability for the French model to actually um, address racial discrimination. Uh, but because there are legal ramifications to racism, theoretically, the criminal offense, uh, it is at least arguably 
in line with, um, with EU law on uh, racial discrimination. It's probably not by all accounts, and I think a lot of lawyers would disagree on that. So, um, but the latitude that's available for member states in the current setup means that some member states can just not even collect racial data and still be um, generally within uh, EU laws obligations. Germany is a bit different. It doesn't outlaw the, um, the classification as such, but the, you know, the government's position is that it doesn't use the category of race to collect disaggregated data on people. And it uses instead a variety of proxy categories, including migration background, language spoken at home, the birthplace of the parents, um, and names. But uh, not all people are actually opposed to the state not using the term race because we can think of recent history where you know the, the classification was used by the state for obviously for, for fascist purposes. Um, and it's it's a bit in between as well because the the term for for race in English doesn't actually invoke the same type of response from from um, uh, from German people as Rasse in German, which has a bit more of the connotation of being linked to the Nazi form of biological race. But in terms of translating that into international law, scholars who argue that race should be, or Rasse even in the German language, should be the term of art that's used to describe um, racialization and racial discrimination, they argue that without the, the concept of race being used, it's hard to then figure out whether there's compliance with EU and international law standards, and it's hard to have discussions across borders about what race and racism mean. But in Germany as well, there is a debate about whether to remove the term Gasse from the German constitution and to provide an adjective based description of what racial discrimination is. So refugee law in, in Europe is also harmonized in some way. Um, and there's also the critique that the member states have lots of latitude lots of room to maneuver with how to put these into, into operation. So there's a common European asylum scheme at the European Union level, and that is um, Article 77 to 80 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union that provide for things like a common um, space for uh, internal, uh, a lack of internal borders, um, referencing the Schengen Equi, which is that the Schengen zone doesn't have border checks um, normally, although they can have border checks for specific purposes. Then there's the there are the three directives that that regulate the processes of um, applying for asylum. The procedures directive, which outlines the actual formal procedures for application. The qualifications directive, which defines what what will qualify for, um, for gaining asylum, but also for gaining uh, something that's kind of one tier below asylum, which is subsidiary protection. So that's humanitarian leave to remain that's not based on a ground that is um, considered within the Geneva Convention definition of, um, of refugees, but still nonetheless leave to remain because if someone were sent back to the country of origin, they would be um, treated inhumanely, tortured, or killed, or persecuted, just not for grounds in the asylum um, definition. And the conditions directive, which outlines the minimum conditions that have to be um, kept for asylum applicants and refugees who arrive in Europe. So the conditions of their, of their life, of their stay. And so these directives leave um, some room to maneuver for states. For example, in, in the German context, there was uh, for a long time a, a requirement that uh, asylum applicants, while their claims are being processed and while they're living in asylum residences, shouldn't cross from one district into another, that they were given tokens instead of money for, for exchange for goods at supermarkets. Um, 
and there was a fine imposed that they would leave their district, which would then further entrench the um, kind of financial instability that they faced. And also um, in, the, in the German context, uh, at least where it's been made quite uh, substantially an issue and a claim of asylum and refugee activists, the residencies that were established for lots of people claiming asylum to live in were put in areas that weren't always the, the ones that were the most conducive to friendly relations between local people and asylum applicants. So in kind of hostile areas in some cases, which exacerbated the possibility of violence against um, vulnerable people living in these asylum uh, residencies. <clears throat> then you have the Dublin regulation. And the Dublin regulation has also changed over the past you know, 15 years. But the Dublin regulation is a regulation that governs um, the, uh, well, the, the main thing that it does is it governs which state decides or should decide on the application, the asylum application of the applicant. And it has mainly to do with the fact that if an applicant lands in one European Union member state and then goes to another member state, they'll generally be sent back to the first member state where they pass through in order to make the claim. And it's, it was thought of as a way to distribute the, um, the costs and the impact of migration, although it's been criticized as not actually effectively doing that. And it was heavily criticized for not, not actually observing the human rights standards that it should have for asylum applicants, for example, those who were minors that were traveling alone and had family or support in one member state, but then because of Dublin could not make asylum claims in those member states were then sent to a different one. There have been exceptions built into the Dublin regulation in more recent years to account for that type of situation or for a situation where someone's making an application at the same time as a relative in a different member state that they could have those applications be joined or make the applications in the same place. So those, those kind of smallish changes have been integrated into the Dublin regulation, but still overall, it's seen as something that is not very effective in spreading out the costs of, um, of applying for asylum. And it still has detrimental impacts on uh, many of those making uh, asylum claims, particularly in in the sense that there have been cases where one EU member state <clears throat> has sent um, asylum applicants uh, back to the first EU member state they passed through, knowing that that first EU member state um, would treat asylum applicants quite poorly, actually in breach of their um, human rights under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So that was the case of MSS uh, versus Belgium and Greece. And, um, and so that seems to be still a liability of the, the common European asylum system, this, this process. Then there's the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, which used to be called Frontex, which it has been, you know, it polices basically the external border of the European Union and the European border surveillance system that includes high tech um, ways to, to actually see the borders. And of course, one needs to just kind of do uh, a little research to see that there are um, very intense criticisms of how the external border of the European Union is policed, including the concept of this kind of fortress of Europe where people are making a very treacherous journey across the Mediterranean or across certain parts of the, uh, of the um, Mediterranean or the Aegean Sea and, and drowning. Um, and I'll get to some, some more specifics about uh, rescue operations in a moment. But that Frontex had, had been seen as complicit in some of the pushbacks um, or the, uh, the over-policing of the borders that made it actually a, a very difficult um, place to, to cross and a hostile terrain for, for people trying to get to safety. <clears throat> 
So the European Union has this common European asylum system. The Council of Europe is uh, responsible for the European Convention on Human Rights, and the Council of Europe is made up of more member states than the European Union, 47 member states. And uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, in particular Articles 3, which are the freedom from torture and inhumane treatment, and Article 8, which is the right to family and private life. Um, and it also has to do with family reuni reunification and family separation, which can affect people who are on the move. Um, those are used to adjudicate the human rights of even of um, people who don't have citizenship. So including the, the rights of um, migrants and, and refugees. And then international law. So the 1951 Geneva Convention on the Status of Refugees uh, outlines that people shouldn't be sent back to a place where they're going to be tortured or um, persecuted, including um, uh, different forms of persecution other than, than uh, well, it's persecution based on uh, things like race and uh, religion, being part of a particular social group, political opinion. Uh, but you're, th that's that's built in also into the language of the European Union laws themselves. So the definition of refugees has been imported from uh, the Geneva Convention definition into European Union law. So there's one case which was seen as a really important case in terms of the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, which is part of the Council of Europe that determines the a European Convention on Human Rights was the Hirsi Jama and others versus Italy case. And that was a ruling on what has become known as the phenomenon of the pushback, or basically when, um, when boats of people at sea, and it can happen on land as well, but what, in, in this case uh, at sea, uh, if a European vessel um, uh, is then intercepts that boat or intercepts people at sea and then sends them back rather than allowing them to make a claim in Europe to, to asylum or refugee against um, human rights law. So it's a violation of the Article 3 uh, rights of those who would have made their claim because it ruled that Italian authorities in this case should have known that returning people to Libya would expose them to arbitrary treatment and, um, and possibly return to their countries of origin where they could be tortured or killed. Um, but there have been reports of pushbacks being made on land um, as well and in ways that are a bit more clandestine. So there was a report, for example, of a pushback being made um, in Greece of a person who had registered as an asylum applicant and was awaiting a claim, but then was brought during the night to the border with Turkey and kind of left there. And they wound up, you know, wandering across the border into Turkey and had to then find um, uh, find their way to a city and wound up in Istanbul um, to make their claim, which is actually against European law. I mean, that's kind of um, done in, in breach of EU law, really. So just to move over to profiling and policing, um, and these are really snippets, but it's it's good to, to see how some of these issues connect up. So it's been reported by the Council of Europe that racial and ethnic profiling happens quite frequently in Europe. And there are certain ways in which this happens in patterns in different places, but the patterns are different depending on which member state you're looking at. And while over-policing and instances of fatal police violence can be statistically evidenced um, to be connected with race and racial profiling in the UK, for example, where ethnic data and racial data is disaggregated and collected, most European countries can't track these patterns because they don't conduct, collect the data. So communities and sometimes NGOs are left to build a case uh, based on their own observations and evidence. Sometimes this is about self-reporting or, or drawing patterns uh, between cases that might not be statistically representative, but cases that are, uh, that are similar enough to actually tell a story that becomes a pattern uh, because of the predictability and the, the, the similarity of the stories. And racial profiling 
happens frequently. I don't know if it happens most of the time in these situations. I think probably not. It probably happens in a very pervasive way, but it happens frequently in relation to identity checks in transit areas under the assumption that non-white people are more likely to be in breach of immigration rules. So there was um, a case in, in Germany, for example, in 2012, I think, where a young man who was German nationally, nationality was German, um, but of African descent was profiled um, 10 times in a year and asked to show ID on a train route that ran um, near, uh, I think it was from Castle to Frankfurt, uh, but it was his route to, to work, but because it's all also known as a route of transit coming from a transit hub, it was very frequently, it was very frequent that the police would profile um, people on, on these trains, but he always noticed that they profiled him and not white passengers on the train. And he, he queried it and then the police, and this is part of shutting down the discussion on racism um, in, a, in kind of a, a really sad way. He, he made a comment to the police that he thought that this reminded him of something and the way that he said it made it clear that it was reminding him of, um, of fascism in Europe and of targeting people and singling them out. And the police officer responded, you know, are you calling me a Nazi? And the, and the young man said, no, that's not what I'm saying. But the police brought him to the station. He finally showed his ID because he refused on the train. And the police basically brought a, um, a slander, it's kind of an insult lawsuit against the young man who then had to counter sue and say, well, the reason I said that was because um, I was profiled so many times in the last year and I feel like I am being singled out. So it was my freedom of expression to make this social commentary. And so the charges were dropped and, um, and the judge agreed that the social commentary was valid. But these types of, this type of profiling, um, you know, there can be a legal proclamation that it's illegal, but the police during that case argued, well, we have limited resources and based on our best intelligence and our best knowledge, uh, looking at how someone looks is actually going to help us to best use our resources when it comes to following up on immigration laws. So the ingrained logic of Europeans with the right to reside in Europe being white translates into policy practice. And I think that's one of the things that needs to be addressed with any um, forward movement on um, addressing structural racism and the links between race and immigration in, in Europe. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna speed up. So there are also these crimes of solidarity that have been identified um, for example, in a, uh, in a report from the Institute of Race Relations, uh, which is called Humanitarian, the Unacceptable Face of Solidarity. And in this report, um, 26 cases, uh, instances were analyzed from across Europe. And it was, there, there were instances in which people had been criminalized for helping um, refugees and asylum seekers to actually pursue their their rights or to be rescued. So um, uh, the, the report mentions um, uh, giving lifts and cookies. Uh, so lifts as in a ride and cookies to, to people uh, seeking, seeking protection in Denmark, warmth and shelter and food to those crossing in Italy, uh, to, from Italy to France sea rescues off the coast of Lesbos and Greece. Um, and, and there are bylaws, there were bylaws, or there may still be bylaws in Calais in France, prohibiting the unauthorized distribution of food and water. Like you might have heard in the United States, there was also that similar case of um, leaving food in, in the desert for people who were crossing into the United States. But so there are member states laws that are set up to basically make it more difficult to help um, refugees and those applying for asylum. So in 2019, it was estimated that by an NGO that Hungary only allowed in two refugees per day, which is very low compared to other countries in the, uh, in the EU, but also um, 
suggest that they're not actually abiding by the laws, international and European laws to allow these applications to be made or relying on third safe country um, lists where they say, if you pass through any safe country, for example, uh, if you pass through Turkey and then come to Hungary, then you have to be sent back to Turkey. Those types of laws uh, or, or provisions allow countries to then reject the vast majority of um, asylum applicants. And for Hungary, not only did they do that, but they, po they, they passed a law in 2018 that imposed jail time um, for helping undocumented immigrants to apply for asylum. So this was a period of time where immigration lawyers and NGOs uh, in favor or NGOs that supported the rights of of asylum applicants were were really under threat and um and it, it was in line with a lot of the anti-immigration politics that were being proposed um the policies being proposed by the incumbent government and in 2018 pia klemp of germany was charged under an italian law with aiding and abetting illegal entry when she rescued a distressed boat of people on the mediterranean uh, she faced uh, 20 years imprisonment and a 300,000 um, euro fine. I don't remember if the outcome has been reached in that case, but it may have been. Um, and, you know, the aiding and abetting was about saying that this rescue was actually cooperating with people who were smuggling, um, who were trafficking uh, individuals into Europe. And so this was aiding and abetting illegal entry, but also trafficking. So that was really how this was proposed, a question of securitization as opposed to humanitarian relief. And since 2014, 12,000 people have died in the Mediterranean between Libya and Europe. And um, the group that Pia Klemp works for estimates that it's, it's rescued 14,000 people. So, I mean, this really is the substantial, um, it's, it's a case that suggests a substantial um, injury to the ability to rescue people at sea, which is um, very shocking. And then to kind of tie in some of what's been happening in mainstream politics in certain member states that is connected with both the politics of race and the politics of, um, of refugee law and refugees in public discourse. So everyone will have heard of the Brexit campaign and been following kind of how the UK has left the European Union. And, you know, that campaign, um, really the, the, the issues in the campaign began before the referendum was announced. Um, and a lot of those issues had to do with the general <clears throat> fear that was stoked in, in, public, in, in public discourse around excuse me, growing numbers of people who would be coming to the UK via the rest of Europe to apply for asylum um, with the idea that a lot of these people were either uh, not entitled to asylum or it would just be too much for the UK to handle. I mean, a couple of legal points on that, of course, um, as I mentioned with the Dublin regulation, it wouldn't be that the UK would be hearing the majority of those cases if they did come through the European space, which is um, kind of misunderstanding of law. But leaving the European Union would potentially mean leaving, and it has meant leaving the Dublin regulation, which is the thing that enables people to be sent to the first EU country they pass through. So it was based on a faulty understanding of European Union law anyway. But the image that I'm showing is a flyer that I received through my door um, during the referendum, which shows all the countries of, you know, the Schengen countries just basically grayed out because those are the countries that are gonna be passed through to get from Syria and Iraq to the UK or from Turkey and Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia to the UK. And the campaign was pitched, the Brexit campaign was pitched on the idea that being a part of um, the European Union with the contiguous Schengen zone is actually a liability in terms of um, net immigration to the UK. And also um, the type of immigration that would raise concerns about terrorism, 
So there were questions around this time about the, because, you know, there was the Charlie Hebdo incident and then there, there was the, um, the, the bomb that was set off in Brussels. There were debates around this time about how the border needed to be securitized against terrorism. Also in this time, the UK passed a law called PREVENT, and it was a policy that devolved the powers to spot radicalization to um, citizens. So basically, if you see something, report it. And that became a duty put on schools and universities and public services in order to um, crack down on, on terrorism, but it really became a way to target um, Muslims. And this is something that's still a very controversial debate, but all of this was going on prior to the Brexit referendum. And so during the referendum and then after Brexit, uh, the, the referendum was, was successful for leaving the UK, um, there was a rise in race-based hate crimes. And Nadine Elanani, my colleague at, at Birkbeck, wrote this uh, really insightful book connecting um, the successive changes in immigration laws that basically made it more difficult for, uh, for people in British overseas territories, in particular in Asia and the Caribbean and Africa, to come to the UK on one hand. And then this nostalgia for this um, Britain first type of um, imperial Britain on the other hand, with Brexit, are a part of a longer trajectory of um, how race has formed the national um, political identity in, in Britain. So it's called Bordering Britain. I highly recommend it. And just a few more comments on the public policy um, uh, discourse in, in the UK, and then I'll move to, to Germany um, before I conclude. The hostile environment policy. So in 2012, there was a policy that was um, known internally within government as the hostile environment policy that was later changed to the compliant environment policy. And it was meant to deter illegal immigration, um, but effectively devolved border control activities to the general public. So employers, landlords, hospitals, schools, universities, service providers, needed to check the immigration background of the people who are working for them or getting services from them um, in ways that it hadn't before. And that raised the level of the scrutiny of private citizens and of service providers, even private service providers, around immigration status. But it also, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism noted, increased racism and xenophobic discrimination more broadly. So there were reports that landlords were less likely to rent to people of color because of the presumption that they might be um, lying or uh, about their immigration status or in need of some leave to remain, uh, whereas those who could be determined without looking uh, at further details that they were, you know, they were white and British were more likely to be housed, for example. Um, and this was the beginning of an era of very open public um, um, anti-immigrant discourse, really, that's only thinly veiled behind uh, policies of, of, um, of law and order, but it's really about deterrence, deterring people from, from migrating to the UK at all. So there were these vans that became very, um, very infamous that Theresa May, when she was the Home Secretary before she became Prime Minister, uh, commissioned and they had these billboards that said, in the UK illegally, go home or face arrest. Text this number and we'll help you go home. And they were just uh, driven around uh, cities. I mean, it's, it's kind of a shocking thing, but the hostile environment policy, I think the name says it all. And then to move to the final example in terms of general public discourse to the right and how it affects people and how it brings together these ideas of race and immigration um, before just um, opening up for the Q&A, is the Alternative for Germany party, which um, was a party that also started like, I think, like the Brexit party. It started on a very strong anti-immigration platform. 
undergirded by the sense that the rising number of um, asylum applicants was going to change the, the constitution of the country and the political and social and religious order of the country. Uh, and so they basically started in 2013 and by 2017, they were the, the third largest party in the national parliament and still have 13% of the seats in parliament. And so this is one of the, uh, the campaign posters of the Alternative for Germany. And, um, and it says, new Germans will make them ourselves. Um, then under, under it says, Deutschland. so trust, your, trust yourself, uh, trust in yourself. So this type of campaign, and there were other similar ones, but this I think is maybe one of the most violent um, types of posters because like I mentioned at the beginning, it's not only relying on a cultural integration um, register of racism, but it really is a return to kind of the eugenic biological form of, of racism and racial othering. Um, I mean, I don't have to break down the details of this. It's quite clear what this message is is saying and it's not uh, an isolated type of narrative for the for this particular party which is seen in Germany as a far-right party and was affiliated with um, with other kind of movements that sprung out of the you know two, 2013 um, uh, a wave of different um, far-right movements like there was this group called Pegida which was also very anti-immigrant um, uh, movement. And it also stemmed out of this, uh, th there's one incident in Germany that happened, which became kind of symbolic for how immigrants and in particular uh, refugees were being framed as, uh, as basically rapists and attackers. Um, so there was this incident in Cologne during a New Year's Eve celebration, a big, you know, uh, outdoor celebration where there were a number of women who reported being attacked. Um, and that was seen as a way to then uh, shed light on the issue of men from other groups being attackers of, of white German women. And so this, this short piece from the Council of European Studies, which can be found online, is just a reflection on that. And it's about uh, the use of women's bodies as border control and this whole phenomenon not being a new one, that this is a way of uh, articulating to the general public that there's a question of, um, of uh, you know, we, we know these tropes. Um, of these violent men who are coming in and who are um, attacking white women, but also unable to integrate and incapable of respecting European values. And that this has to be stemmed because um, the future of Europe is at stake. So it's, it's really, I mean, I have, there are many examples that I can think of, but I don't need to, you know, I think people get the point. But this is this is kind of what has driven the I think the public um, sense of an urgency to act around forming political parties around anti-immigration in this new um, new era. But it's using very old discourse, and it's it's very tied to biological forms of racism, even if um, the majority of what's being discussed is at the level of culture and integration. There's continuity there. And I think the myth of the immigrant rapist and the poster by the AFD that shows this um, pregnant white belly uh, saying we'll make our own Germans is, is a testament to that and how it informs the general public about what we should do about it. So I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of deep reflection for this conclusion in terms of where we go from here, but I think one thing is to try to think of ways to implement and act on European Union um, uh, positions. I'm calling them positions because they're not laws or policies yet. They're really recommendations and, and ideas in this action plan, but things to, ways to, to, to give these plans some teeth and some deep consideration. Uh, because of course, 
law and policy is not going to solve the, the problem of kind of structural racism or or ideological forms of racism but we've got to do more than recognize the existence of of racism and in a similar way the um criminalization of helping refugees is kind of it's so far removed from what humanitarian laws um, theoretically set out to do but even stepping back from that it's very hard to get to another place to claim asylum in the first place i mean there are there are issues of um you know issues that we can critique about the asylum system not really being fit for the purpose of really helping people who are in need of finding safety. But in terms of making the situation in Europe better for those who are seeking safety in Europe and who are both experiencing racism and discrimination based on migration status, um, it really is important to think of race and migration in a way that's joined up, but doesn't attribute all um forms of racism to questions of xenophobia uh and that actually sees people's vulnerability um in ways that are are specific enough to actually do work in, in figuring out how to how to have real policy solutions uh, to these problems and i guess the final thing is to um is to to support organizations that are working um that are basically working with and and run by um, people who are seeking asylum and applying for, for for asylum in Europe. And I think that's you know part of the problem is that because of things like you know the deterrence approach and securitization approach in lots of member states, um, people are valiantly expressing their their voices, but feel dis disenfranchised or like they have to live under the radar when making political proclamations and trying to get these um, new policies uh, off the ground. So, I mean, it's difficult to to know any solutions, but um, but I think it's more about thinking about how the issues are joined up and how to do to to hold member states accountable for the relatively um, advanced types of principles that are that are being recognized, such as structural forms of discrimination. So I think I've talked for longer than I should have. And now I will hand it over to I think Laura and Justin uh, for, for a Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, I really appreciate your sharing all of this um, insight with us. I, I might take the opportunity to ask the first question, um, which I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about, um, just from a very big picture perspective, there's so much, um, it seems like there's a, a fair amount of heterogeneity in ter across European, across countries within the EU, in terms of um, the level of their so potential strategies to support um, refugees and also level of animosity against refugees. And I wonder if you could, if you have any thoughts about some factors that you feel like might be associated with that variation. Does that make sense? In terms of public, like public opinion in different member states? Public policy or public opinion in different member states, yeah. <sighs> I mean, I, I really don't know. I, I haven't read studies other than some quite now out of date studies about media representation because there have been studies about what the what mass media says about refugees and how that might influence or at least correspond to without directly causing um, public opinion that's uh, against refugees, for example. But um, but I think other levels of public discourse around issues that might seem otherwise adjacent. I think that they do affect public policy. I mean, sorry, uh, public opinion and policy towards refugees. So in the UK, for example, um, there was recently a, a home office decision to start to house people who are applying for asylum 
in barracks in like former military barracks that weren't really fit for purpose and were in the middle of a pandemic and x y and z and that probably wouldn't have been um thinkable prior to this hostile environment type of policy where the entire frame of um of immigration control shifted to one where deterrence was the main model and the public started to kind of just internalize this model of deterrence um it's not to say that term deterrence wasn't a model before but it was it, it's become such a um a central part of home office policy and practice in the uk and at the same time you know protests have grown around this but then there's also a crackdown on how protests are dealt with in, in, in the uk and kind of a demonization demonization of protests and so we just had this bill this policing and crime bill here passed that um that put more conditions on uh, or it's passing uh, that put more conditions on protests nonviolent protests noise related conditions and and etc and so i think the general environment also sets up a situation where it would be surprising if the general public were more um proactively in favor of a, a less punitive and less um surveillance and deterrence based approach to to refugees in the uk and brexit and and the popular discourse in in policy terms seems to embolden people which has an impact also on the traction that these policy positions have so i really do think that on def different levels we probably need to put the brakes on this um perpetuating of or normalizing of, of these types of, of ideas because I think they affect both policy and public perception um, mutually. Thank you, Eddie. We have a lot of questions coming into the question and answer forum, but before we get to those, which we will do shortly, I know that Anna Hardman also has a question that she was interested in asking, so she's going to ask that uh, on the video. Um, I, I'm interested because the two European countries I'm most familiar with are England, where certainly the Brexit debate seemed to make it possible to talk op more openly about, to make it make racist statements more openly than in it, the England that I knew, so to speak. I, I came from there. I'm an English person who's immigrated to the US. Uh, but also to Greece. So I wanted to talk about those two. And in England, I see much more open racism um, and really worry about things, things like the treatment of the Windrush generation and immigrants being included as a sort of package with any immigrant who doesn't look uh, white. And it, it, it frightens me as do some, some similar things in the US. But Greece is an interesting example because when I first went there uh, 40 years ago, it was a country that was very anti-immigrants of any kind. I remember buying it when I was working at the Central Bank, in the Bank of Greece, buying a newspaper and being told, oh, you know, who are you? What are you doing? I'm working at the Bank of Greece. You can't possibly, you're a foreigner. I said, no, I'm not a foreigner. I'm a Greek citizen. And he says, was your father a Greek? No. Well, then you will never be a Greek. And that for someone who is accustomed to the US norm that you can become an American, it certainly doesn't have to be your father either. And, and what I've seen over those 40 years is a softening of that attitude. Um, that, that in fact, you know, Greeks are very happy to acknowledge Adetokumbo as theirs. He's a Greek um, and he's a basketball player who, whose parents immigrated from Africa. I see not just in Athens among educated people, but on an island where I've spent a fair amount of time and which is close to the coast of Turkey, so has received a lot of refugees. And the island really rallied round to welcome the refugees who were making it to the, to, to the island. The hoteliers out of season made rooms available. Uh, there was a big effort. I, I find it interesting that in one country, I see this is not uni universal. This is not 
uh, everywhere, there's also real concern precisely because the government's attitude has continued to be negative because the state treatment of refugees has been negative. But I find it interesting the ways in which attitudes are changing and yet I have seen very little research on that. I wondered if you could comment. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I, 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 I certainly see as well that there's, I mean, there there is this kind of heightening of, of discourse in both ways. There's an attentiveness to sh structural issues that um, people are facing, what the refugees are facing and what people are facing in terms of racism generally. And there's a there's an increased awareness, the vocabulary has been building. And I think this is partly due to the direness of the situations in, in many ways. So the there, there is kind of a skilling up and, a, and the, the building of tools to kind of identify and articulate what's happening. Um, and an increase in, in care of a lot of people who think it's an issue that is going to affect their lives, whereas maybe 10 years ago, they didn't think it would affect their lives. And now they see it as, as, as an issue. But then on the other hand, there's such a normalization of this kind of, this racism. And like you say, um, to see overt racism in the UK, it's not that it hasn't been there, but in the in the ways that it's resurfaced with this, um, you know, like I said, with the hostile environment policy and then with Brexit, it's really emboldened people to stay and do things that they otherwise may not have done publicly for fear of at least violating some social norms. But I like I say, it's it's so hard to it's it's hard to overstate the impact that like leadership and governmental leadership has on the ways that people will express their their racisms and their fears um, in quite shocking ways. And I, I I like your point about the issue of becoming because that is something in Europe that I sometimes forget to to mention to colleagues who are outside of Europe and you'll, you describe it really well, that there's this sense of, um, of ethno-nationalism. And like I'm saying it there without necessarily um, prejudging it, but just to describe the phenomenon that it doesn't cross the minds of many Europeans to think of being authentically from a place as being kind of ethnically um, kind of representative of that place in a, in a kind of this mythical ethno-nationalist sense. So many of my friends in the UK um, who are people of color, it was actually a question on the census. Do you consider yourself um, British, English, Scottish, Welsh, uh, Northern Irish? And people of color won't pick English if British is there because being British is kind of ideologically a bit more open and being English sounds, it sounds like there's already a pre-exclusion of people of color from being English because that sounds like an ethnic category in, in a way that it's not only nationality. And that's sometimes easy to forget. I think because I think it's that way in, a, in most European countries in social life that they encounter that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of questions and let me, maybe I'll group some of them together. Um, so a, a question from Emma Gonzalez Puel is, do you believe that the EU has been using the COVID pandemic as a way to make it more difficult for migrants to enter EU countries? That's a good question. I'm, I, I would assume, I would assume so. I mean, in, um, I mean, this isn't EU anymore, but I know there were certain zones of the world that were just put on special uh, lists from the UK, for example, where which put like all of Latin America was on the red list. Um, so you couldn't actually uh, fly in without quarantining a hotel. Uh, but I think I, I mean, I think there's room for for the EU to to really do that. Things change quite quickly though, and I'm not quite sure what the regulations are right now for, um, for travel. But I can imagine that if there are restrictions, they can be country-based because 
countries have the authority to do do that based on nationality but then they can they can also disproportionately impact people who would typically be coming from certain countries if certain provisions are put in place that make it difficult for people to meet those provisions um, so my presumption is that there will will be the latitude for for that to happen i just don't i just am not caught up right now on the the actual policies that that are being discussed on what's going to happen in the next few months in terms of, of travel from outside of the eu inside the eu there's regulation so i i would imagine outside it's going to be even more there's another question from uh, christian jepson um with a comment by isabella trombetta so so christian asks which EU state has the worst record for criminalizing aid workers? And Isabella proposes uh, from her position as an Italian aid worker in the Mediterranean Sea that perhaps Italy is, is uh, uh, leading that uh, unfortunate uh, category. But yeah. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think, I think Italy is certainly a contender. Greece and Italy have been seen as, well, Italy, and France have been written up in that report that I mentioned, and I'll put it in the chat, um, as countries that have had either laws or policies forbidding giving food and drink to migrants um, under the provision that that's um, aiding and abetting smuggling. But then there are, um, um, I mean, Hungary though, Hungary has, laws that are so restrictive, not even just about aiding people in physical transit, but aiding them legally, that I would also say that Hungary is a contender for kind of one of the worst violations because it's about not even allowing um, kind of the, the legal aid that's due to them under European and international laws. Because using anti-smuggling as a way to justify intervening on a rescue and then saying that the rescue wasn't a rescue, at least has, I'm not saying it's genuine, but at least has a, a legalistic kind of approach that's being counterbalanced against security, which is usually what's used as a restriction on, on migration or as increased police powers. But the Hungary law was just a restriction on legal aid um, of any kind and it's very broad. So I think one of those two countries would probably be um, top of the list. I'm going to put this um, link into the chat. Uh, <clears throat> a troubling strategy to criminalizing access to criminalize directly access to the law itself. Uh, yeah, to, to basically end the and the criminalization is against the um, legal service providers. Exactly, the people who are helping. So it really does silence that kind of help altogether. Um, another question is about um, projections for climate associated immigration. Um, you know, that obviously with climate change, people are estimating that there will be more and more uh, climate induced migration, climate refugees, um, and I think given um, the implication the question is that given the places that are uh, most um, likely to experience adverse effects of of the of global heating um, that this will continue to mix um, race and refugee status um, and so the question is what kinds of help from the un or from ngos or others would help address the needs of host countries and climate refugees. If you were um, sort of kind of planning longer term, more strategically, how would you approach this? Uh, it's a really good question. And I think, I mean, first of all, there is there is a protection gap in, in terms of protecting people who are, um, who are on the move. And I say that because you might be on the move within a certain region. Um, because of environmental devastation. And it's not considered uh, a convention ground, but there could potentially be some sort of leave to remain, but it's it's kind of a, it's a category that hasn't really been um, provided for in in asylum law in, in, a, in a particular way, but refugee law kind of under the UN um, protection scheme for resettlement 
is dealt with, but also in a way that isn't um, isn't equitable in terms of the geopolitics, uh, because people usually are resettled in neighboring countries, which then are absorbing large numbers of people and might not actually have the resources um, to take people in. I mean, I think in general, my idealistic view on this would be that um, countries that can can help should then provide ways that resettlement can happen in those countries. And there are schemes of resettlement that resettle people, including to the United States and to, to certain European Union countries, um, not really to the UK, which takes very few um, resettled um, refugees. But the, but the issue is the scale. And, um, and I think countries with the resources and with the space need to scale up their accommodation of people who are going to be displaced in bigger and bigger numbers in the future because of environmental catastrophes. And at the very least, and I've not made this link in a scholarly way, but I know people have, in the very least, in consideration of the fact that the um, developed world produces a lot of the reasons that climate catastrophes happen. I mean, thinking of global warming or um, certain types of investment in certain resources. So there is a moral and ethical question, case to answer in terms of why um, you know, the global north, I guess, wouldn't um, be more proactive in, in allowing people to resettle because of climate reasons who would typically only cross borders. Um, Yeah. I think that there's a there's a strong case to be made, as you said, for some type of um, uh, just moral responsibility in general, never mind the additional responsibility of having created the, the greenhouse gases. I'm um, not sure of that. Um, so coming back to the very beginning video, there was a question um, about who's represented in the video that, um, you know, there's, the, you know, you brought up kind of colonialism and it's this very colonial a kind of neo-colonial relationship with people from former, formerly colonized parts of the world. Um, and the question was asking, um, how have uh, North America or other parts of Eastern Europe who are not part of the EU been represented in, in pro-EU expansion messaging? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I struggle to think of how the US has been depicted in kind of um, this type of broad register of symbolic messaging. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, the EU in maybe verbal communications puts forward that the, U the US is, you know, a huge and valuable trading partner and that there's some parity, that there's like kind of an equivalence of parity between the EU as a kind of a, a single market and the US in terms of size and strength and that sort of thing. It was very masculine in terms I just used, but um, in just in terms of the, the scale of the, the markets. Um, but then I think Eastern Europe has been a, I think there's been a fraught way in which um, Eastern European um, countries have been depicted in, in the EU. So for instance, Poland, when Poland entered the EU in 2004, there was a transitional period between, you know, 2004 and I think it's 2013 or something um, for, for being able to work in certain EU countries because of a fear that it would just be too much too quick. And I think part of that, you know, of course that could be seen on paper as a purely economic rationale about the numbers of workers in a particular market. But I think in, in, real, in real terms, that, that also took on a, um, an, underturn, uh, uh, an undertone, undertone of, uh, of disparaging people from Eastern Europe, both culturally and in terms of education level and, um, and in terms of stereotypes. So you, you do get this stratification, I think, even within the EU, even now. Um, and it's sometimes around policies and getting people to change policies that these debates arise. But the, the, the undertone of kind of, um, of cultural 
exclude the, the politics of cultural exclusion, I think, um, takes over when when then you see public debates about um, what Poland is in or isn't doing is or isn't doing um, right in terms of human rights. Um, or, you know, in those beginning years of expansion, the economic policies that were put in place. But I think there's, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's also the need for Europe to seem unified. So there isn't a lot of the airing of that on a, on a register of messaging and communicating these ideas of difference in this in the same way. So that video, I think, was a very particular one that tried to put the European Union on par or in some constellation with BRIC countries that were growing economically very quickly, and that the European Union was going to have to lead that economic growth by kind of subduing and controlling the relationship in the market, but it was put into racial and gender terms. So yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we're, we're basically out of time, but I wanted to give you a few seconds to answer the last question, um, which was just um, what, what role do you see for the EU as an institution um, playing in the perception of immigration and are there particular legal, um, particular laws or legislation that um, you see coming uh, that would be helpful in that front? Or that should um, I think, I mean, <laughs> It's interesting because the case law at the European Union level on certainly on race and also to some extent on on refugees isn't I think the strength of the EU is on in the legislation and in I mean I'll probably uh, this is probably not completely accurate what I'm what I about what I think even um, so I'll just say it this way I think the strength of the leadership of the European Union is going to lie in how it tries to implement the, the changes based on the human rights impacts that it's already recognizing um, that are affecting refugees and people of color um, across the member states. And I think that recognition is gaining a lot of strength, but I think the leadership is going to be how it sets up a workable model for member states to actually um, translate into law and policy in those member states. Because member states, if given latitude, will simply say, oh, we're doing it, and this is how we're doing it. But sometimes that doesn't actually affect people's lives in the way that one might expect it does. And so I think setting goals and targets uh, and making and holding member states to account to specifics is going to be really important for the EU if it's going to lead. Thank you so much. I think that's a great note to note to end on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bruce Jones, for spending this time with us, and thank you to all of the participants who joined. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Justin. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>